It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a, a great honor to be here. And it's a, a great feast for myself to see so many of my friends that have shaped me in the audience. I see Rob Holty, I see Rich Sutton, um, Jonathan, of course, uh, your fantastic machine learning faculty, Russ, Mike. Um, it's great to be here. And it's great to be in Edmonton. I was here many years ago and gave a talk on robotics. Um, I won't give you all the answers today, but I hope I release you with some questions about education. You all chosen to be an education institution, as have I dedicated my life to education. And I recently, through an accident, stumbled into something that might actually have a positive impact on people. It became so important to me that I decided to effectively quit my various other positions. And I'm spending all my time on it, trying to figure out how to do it right. On the road is 100 miles. I have the first two or three miles behind me. I need all of you to go that path together with me, because what is on the other end could be quite substantial. So let me tell you my story. My story starts uh, last year in February, when I um, attended TED, a conference uh, in Los Angeles, where a former hedge fund assistant manager gave what was thought to be widely the best TED talk that year. His name was Salman Khan. And what he'd done is he had recorded himself giving math explanations for his nieces so they could understand high school math. And in that pursuit, and putting this on YouTube, he realized, wow, there's a dozen other people who also watch these videos. And he sent a mail and encouraged him to do more. Over the past six years, he made a collection of several thousand videos, have been viewed several hundred millions of times. And what they are, short, beautiful lectures to really explain basic concepts. So here I was, a Stanford professor, getting ready for my fall class that I teach with Peter Novick, typically to 200 students, which is large by Stanford standards. So I was a successful professor, realizing there's this guy who teaches tens and hundreds of millions of people. What am I doing? So motivated also by two of my colleagues, Andrew Ng and Daphne Koller, who currently run a company called Coursera, who had been playing with the video medium for several years, I decided, and Peter and I decided, to put our class online. And instead of elaborately planning what that actually meant, we just sent one email to the AAAI, which is the American or the Association for the Advancement of AI, has a distribution list of about a thousand researchers in the field of artificial intelligence. And here's the email we sent. It sends on a Friday afternoon. It said, well, introduction to artificial intelligence, taught by Professor Sebastian Kwan and Peter Novik. Um, you can sign up at a website we just purchased, aiclass.org. Starts in October. And the important words were, um, well, anyone who takes the class can interact with us. And I'm missing a sentence. Students are graded the same way as Stanford students, so you can compare yourself. Peter and I sat together and asked how many students to expect. A hundred, maybe a thousand. I was the most outrageous among us by proclaiming it would be 10,000 students. It was Friday afternoon. Come Saturday morning, I wake up and the count is already 5,000. Sunday, 10,000. Monday morning, 14,000, when I get my first phone call from Stanford, who had forgotten <laughs> to inform and to whom I had to apologize. In no time, that enrollment grew to 160,000, at which point we decided to close it down. It's kind of frightening to have 160,000 students from over 200 countries. There were more students enrolled from the country of Lithuania than Stanford had students. And we literally had no clue what to do. Absolutely no clue what to do. So we had a month left, or two months left. We had a, a former Alberta Edmonton student, Mike Sokolsky, um, hack together, together with my PhD student, David Stevens, uh, a system to be able to serve videos and take this class online. Peter and I would spend a lot of time in my basement recording between all kinds of dirty laundry and other things. 
Um, and we had only one belief at the time, which was, well, we we're probably going to crash and burn. It's going to be the biggest embarrassment of our life. But there's one pedagogical idea that we really wanted to push through at the time, which was we didn't want to lecture. We didn't want to lecture. And the reason is I just don't think lecturing is the right thing to do on the internet. And the way I know is every time I encounter a lecture, I do what the average YouTube user does with YouTube. I think the average time YouTube videos are being watched is like something like nine seconds. So I don't, I don't, I don't last that long. And neither would my students. So we decided to think about it more as a sequence of quizzes, a sequence of exercises that we give the students. So that the students had to do the work about artificial intelligence and not us. We started really primitive. We started literally with a napkin and a, and a pen. My wife had given me uh, for my birthday a nice camcorder, um, which I put on a tripod. And then we recorded my hand, writing out scribbling problems. When they got wrong, frequently we cut these pieces of paper in half and retained the correct part and put over the wrong path. And what Mike and David did, um, here's a typical situation where I explain deseparation, a concept in artificial intelligence. And what we did a lot is uh, really go from quiz to quiz to quiz to quiz. And the quizzes were kind of primitive. There were multiple choice. Some of them were numerical. There wasn't anything really sophisticated. Uh, so we had to deal with very primitive technology at the time. So here's a typical quiz. Uh, the video would seamlessly uh, move into a frame that looked like, a, like this. Uh, in fact, YouTube just published very recently a similar um, provision on YouTube. And then students uh, were asked to really click these, these dots and take their chances. And then after they hit the submit button, you would tell them where they gotten it right and where they've gotten it wrong. That was the basic element. We added uh, real-time office hours uh, where we had a, a discussion forum where students could ask questions and there was a rudimentary interaction. In the discussion forum, our belief was even if you have, have 100,000 students, you won't really encounter 100,000 different questions. You get many of the same questions. So we, we following the, the example of Stack Overflow, we set up a discussion forum where students could vote things up and down and the most upvoted questions were the ones we answered, which typically were either technical questions or, Sebastian, you look tired. Now, bizarre things happened. First of all, we didn't lose all 160,000 students in one day. I mean, I should tell you, this was completely open. There was no admissions. They weren't selected. So all you had to do is submit your email address to be a student. Uh, so admissions was very low, hanging food. Uh, but also meant that all kinds of people involved, people you'd never think would involve in artificial intelligence at Stanford. We had a volunteer army of 1,950 people that raised their hand and said, I'd like to translate them to my own language. And we started with 44 languages of translation, some languages I don't even recognize. I have no clue what Telugu is, maybe some of you know. Um, and we went into this um, really uh, have no clue where this is leading us. And then, in addition to watching the students' exercise, seeing their results, emails start trickling in by the thousands of people telling us things about themselves. And that was the moment which really changed my life. And I have a few testimonies prepared for you to understand the emotions I went through doing this. I was completely unprepared. The the essence of what happened is that the students taking those were fundamentally different than Stanford students. And I prided myself being a Stanford professor, it's an amazing institution, so I can work with the best students. But through this process I realized these might be the best students, but they're not the ones that need my help the most. So here's a person uh, who sent me an email out of the blue saying, I'm completing the course from remote areas of Afghanistan and often don't have great internet connectivity or electricity or internet connection that doesn't block YouTube. We use YouTube. I spent the last few days under incoming mortar and rocket attacks, then dodging checkpoints under questionable legal status to exfiltrate a war zone to a third world airfield until things settled down. I had about an hour of fairly solid internet connectivity to be able to get the assignments done and still manage a respectable score. This is a typical week here for me. That's not your typical Stanford student. 
that's not the person I made my material for. And yet this person went through amazing efforts to get my homework assignment done in time that didn't even count for credit. Here's another one. It's a longer one uh, by Sabrina, with whom I exchanged quite a few emails. And this is prompted on an email I sent her saying, hey, you're falling behind. I sent it to her and to about 40,000 other students. Uh, you're falling behind. And then these 40,000 other students, I got maybe 20,000 emails back saying why they're falling behind. And I read a good fraction of those, maybe a percent or two. Um, evenings I just spent reading email. I'm just going through this and I think, my God, what's happening? She's a, a, a single mother of two. And like so many mothers, dropped out of education when kids came. It's a very common theme. Had a child only seven months old teething. And then there was a series of great other setbacks. Her job was threatened by the economic climate. Person life exploded. Baby's sick. Another family member sick. Another one losing their home. The list goes on and on. And then she saw my email on November 15th. She'd given up. And when she saw my email, she says, I can't give up. I have to do this for myself because I want to, because it makes me feel good. And she has no use for this class other than proving to herself that she can do it. And she went all the way to the end and finished the class with distinction. That's not your typical Stanford student. And then, most importantly, there were emails that taught me something. Moments where I was shocked about how I, as a teacher, was failing my students. Here's one where one sentence made me think really deeply, and the sentence really moved me. We'd set up the class just like a regular Stanford class. There was a fixed timeline, fixed every week something new. There were deadlines. And hard as the teacher, as I've been, and Rich Sutton can confirm that a fairly hard ass guy. Right, Rich? Here we go. Hey, Rich. I, I'd, I'd even programmed the system to say, in every exam, you get one chance. And if you get it wrong, I give you a failing grade. That person pointed out to me that I was discouraging his daughter, whom we had hoped for, that this would be the last chance to get her educated, because she got failing grades. And he asked the question, why on earth, in the internet age, are you using classes to weed out people? And then I realized something that Sal Khani, she said in his talk, which is, we're setting people up for failure in education. Sal Khan's example is the following. He says, when you train a person to ride a bicycle, a young child, you don't give them just half a year, and when they fail, you give them a failing grade, and then move on to the motorcycle. Nope, you take the time it takes. And if it takes a little longer, that's just fine. But at the end of the day, your child is able to do it, and that's what matters. Education system is exactly the opposite. A high school math student, so Salman Khan teaches us, we give them fixed time, and if they don't manage to, to succeed, we give them a failing grade, we brand mark them a loser, and then we drag them into the next class where there are missed the prerequisites, and they can't possibly recover. So the outcome is they're being told they're loser, 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 loser. That's what our education system does to so many of us. I'm sure some of you in the audience have experienced the same thing in high school. That made me really think about education quite a bit, about the fixed timing that I think is wrong, about the fixed path that I think is wrong and we have to fix, and about feedback to students. That's why so many of my videos say, wow, you did it. That's quite amazing. I had people writing me, this is the first time in their life that someone told them, you are amazing. And it's a recorded voice to 160,000 students. It still means a lot. The other thing that blew my mind, that's a positive message, is I was, at the time I was going to a Rihanna concert, I'm a big Rihanna fan, and there were like 50,000 people, 40,000 people, I was thinking, my God, my class is bigger than this concert hall. But at the same time, um, I got a lot of people saying that they felt a connection to me as, a, as an instructor. There were speculations how fatigued I was during recording. Uh, there were examples that I brought in about that involved family and personal fortune, what have you, that people speculated about. Uh, and I got lots of personal emails. And this is one of the many ones that just said it's intimate. And I was wondering how could you possibly 
have an intimate experience of something you, that is basically just a computer recording. It's like a, I don't know, one of these phone recordings when you call up an airline company and puts you on hold. Um, and that was really interesting. I, I don't fully understand it to the present day how it worked, but many, many people felt there was an intimacy that was just magical. And perhaps it was the low technology. Perhaps it wasn't all glitzy PowerPoint. Maybe it was my hand. Maybe it was my voice. Maybe my enthusiasm or my consternation when, when I was tired um, that made it intimate. But people felt a sense of interactivity with me. Now, here's some uh, people in the class speaking for the class. AI class for me and for so many others was nothing short of the gift of life. It opened for me the door to a vast amount of knowledge to use for my research and gave me the thrill of being a student again. AI class reminded me and continues to inspire me to always think of the most exciting dynamic ways that I can to solve problems. With the help of the class, I have necessary background required to further my education myself. I learned many algorithms and applications which helps me a lot in my research of com computer vision. I have never thought math can be so fun before I saw these schools. In AI class, I got to learn some really exciting stuff and talk about it with people from all over the world. I discovered an exciting and fascinating field for free and from my kitchen. AI class. So this video goes on and on. Let me, let me show you one video by Melody Bliss that really made me cry. Hello, my name is Melody Bliss, and I was an advanced track student at Stanford for their online introduction to artificial intelligence class taught by Professor Sebastian Thrun and Peter Norvig. I am also a disabled woman going through dialysis three times a week. In addition, I am still working full time as a systems engineer for a local company. Because of this, I went to this class knowing that I would have serious constraints upon my time and that gave me some trepidation going into the class, since there would be many days where, due to the dialysis or other factors, I just would not have the energy to even watch a short video. The enthusiasm that the professors exhibit, however, throughout the class, engages you, energizes you, and affects you with the same enthusiasm for the subject. The short lectures with quizzes helps you realize that, yes, you are understanding the material, and if you realize that you are not, it is easy to go back and review the information until suddenly you get that light bulb over your head effect. What I love most about this class, however, is how it has given me new ideas and how I could possibly implement AI practices in the work that I do today. This has been one of the best classes that I have ever taken, and in my opinion, a wonderful use of the time that I hold precious to me. So I urge you, if you are considering taking this class, to do so. It has changed my life, and I believe it can change yours, too. Last weekend, we had a uh, global meetup where we met Udacity students at about almost 400 locations. And the person coming up to me uh, was Melody Bliss. And I finally have a photo of her and me. It's quite amazing. Uh, I was really happy to take this photo. Education and higher education today is, is in a crisis. We all know this. We are not reaching the students who need our help. It's uneconomical. It has dubious quality at times. And it's in need of innovation. Rich Tomillo, a colleague from Georgia Tech, who's written a book about it, says the most recent technological innovation that affected education in a noticeable way was the invention of the blackboard in 1801. You could argue that PowerPoint had an effect, but I'm not sure it's that positive. In addition to this, if you come to the United States, I think Canada is much better. In fact, the next graphic is in favor of Canada and Finland and in disfavor of the United States. The United States is the biggest spender of education, uh, but has decreasing with, uh, output and its international rank is going down. Something is happening in Canada that's just great that is not happening in the United States. There's been an explosion of for-profit companies in the United States that educate people, that find themselves exclusively, or almost exclusively, for government money, and they've left behind 
possibly the biggest national debt uh, component in the United States right now. There's an explosion of government funding, Title IV uh, funding, Cal grants, and so on. And many of these places have graduation rates south of 10%. In fact, I've heard of a recent university that lost accreditation, had 50 professors and 2,300 recruiters in the United States. The tuition rate has grown twice the rate of uh, inflation for the last 30 years, since 1982. And the cumulative debt uh, coming from tuition in the United States is now one trillion dollars. It's an eighth of the U.S. economy. It exceeds the cumulative housing debt and exceeds the cumulative uh, credit card debt. So it's the biggest debt in the United States and it's not forgivable. So we're in a situation that's really dire where the education has become less and less accessible, more and more expensive. The utility of a degree has gone down, not up over the years. And many refer to this as the new bubble that is about to burst. And I believe it is a bubble about to burst. So for me, entering this is not just about um, experimenting with education as a whole. It's also to help people and help possibly do the biggest thing I can do in my life, um, which is really empower people. I always think about the things that I do. I'm occasionally trying to change all of transportation, and I try to change all of mobile devices, the Google Glass, uh, and other things. Um, I think of myself as trying to, to take on big industries, but this is the most important one because humans and human resources are the most important resources on the planet. They're more important than energy or water or fresh air. We are, we are the planet, and we are neglecting ourselves in, a, in, a, in an almost criminal way, in my opinion. So we started Udacity as an experiment, and it's a company, it's a for-profit company, um, to really push this forward and innovate on the education side. And we launched about 15 classes so far. I'm going to give you some examples of how we do this right now. The mantra of Udacity is uh, to really strive for excellence and really put student exercise front and center above everything else. So our, our teaching is not centered around lectures and not existing classes. They're all new classes. They're all uh, focused around help a person do it themselves. There's a saying that says you can uh, buy a man a fish and he has dinner for the night, or you can teach him how to fish and he has dinner for the rest of his life. That's what we're after. So here's an example. Let's see this place. Welcome to Landmark Pacific. I'm Andy Brown, the instructor for this course. And here we are on location in Siracusa, Italy. This course is really designed for anyone. If you have no background in physics but know a little bit of algebra, you're going to succeed in the course. In Unit 1, we're going to begin with a question that fascinated the Greeks. How big is our planet? Today, it's easy to answer that question. You can go to Google and type, what is the circumference of the Earth? But 2,000 years ago, the Greeks didn't have Google. Still, a man named Eratosthenes was able to answer this question using nothing more than some basic assumptions about the Earth and the Sun, along with an understanding of geometry, trigonometry, and shadows. So this unit, um, this is the introduction video, um, confronts you with quiz after quiz after quiz. And in the end, you can take a measuring tape and a clock, and you can work on how big the Earth is. Okay? So, let's look at the first quiz, and now the technology becomes very scruffy. Before we can answer the question of what the Earth's circumference is, we need to start thinking about what the shape of the Earth is, or neither of these. Go ahead and select one button for each of these four points. So I'm, I'm obviously jumping over the setup of the quiz, but this is your very first quiz as a physics student, and you're being asked something that's actually non-trivial, which is, what of these uh, examples is, is evidence that the world is either a sphere, a disk, or neither? And that's your experience. You're being asked to think. So let's think together. The Earth casts a circular shadow uh, on the moon during a lunar eclipse. Is this evidence for a circular uh, disk or neither? Ha. See? That's how learning takes place. So you can, you can, you can cast your votes. And uh, we had the governor of California cast his votes, and we had the Annie Duncan cast his votes, um, and submit them, and typically they're wrong. And often in these quizzes you get a hint. Here we didn't get a hint. Um, let's see. 
when you get it right, you get the positive feedback, and you always put a video in showing how the instructor solves the problem. I'm in Syracuse with my assistant, uh, Roberta, and apparently most of Syracuse as well. We are going to do uh, the experiment we've been learning about, Eratosthenes experiment, where he determines the circumference of the Earth measuring shadows. So now he's taking this lady, and he's actually working it out with her. And you, you know, about an hour or two hours into this class, have learned all the basic math and trigonometry to solve this problem, and you're being asked to do the same thing. Um, on the discussion forums, people were challenging each other to do this themselves, and, and they posted lots of pictures and, and, and results among each other. There was a lot of peer interaction. And this is my favorite. This guy actually went to the equator to measure the circumference of the planet on the equator and with his little daughter and his son and sent back a picture. There was an entire community around this. And one last thing I want to emphasize is we push this a little bit further, just multiple choice and numerical questions, um, into programming. So. Um, some of our quizzes now go from a explanation. This is not dissimilar from Angry Birds. You're learning the physics how to shoot a, a boat behind a wall. These are not Angry Birds and these are not pigs, but otherwise the same thing. And once this thing is set up and get into the quiz, the quiz becomes a programming environment. And all of a sudden, you find yourself in Python, which is a programming language, where you can type in numbers and you can run it. Maybe I don't know what the right numbers are here. 60 uh, and 30. And you run it, and in real time, you get a little picture of what you just did. And of course, you might then modify it and learn something about physics. Um, maybe you should aim lower and less velocity. And of course, that one's wrong as well, until you finally, oh, oh now I hit the mountain. OK, and I finally um, get it right. I think 45, 45 is the right answer. So, if you take the class, please forget the right answer. Okay. But now, when you've done all the math and you programmed it yourself, you know it. Okay. You walk home thinking, I can do it. And that's what I'm after. I want to empower the student. There's also, a, if you're interested in entrepreneurial, there's a nice new class on how to start a company that has much better visual quality, but I'm going to skip here. Um, we, we started opening this up in February, and now it's September, so we've been around for a few months. Um, we had about 750,000 signups. I think it's even more right now. We issued 50,000 certificates, um, and we also worked a little bit on the job side, so we have a provision by which students can send CVs. So we got several thousand of those, and then we give them to companies. There's about 350 companies on the network right now, and then some of them actually pay. And then we find student jobs, and we've placed about 20 students in jobs so far. And there's a lot of stuff we built to make this happen. But that's just the beginning. Um, student feedback is mostly positive. There's a lot of negative feedback as well. The most negative one is a recent article on angry math by a professor, um, an instructor, who looked at my stats class and didn't like it. And I encourage you to read it. It's very, very negative. It's shockingly awful. Uh, and I responded to it, hopefully, in a constructive way. Um, but, um, but mostly, it's just vastly positive. So we had a high school competition where almost 100% of our high school students say they would happily take more classes in the summer in the future. High school kids have a hard time uh, doing useful things in summer. We all know that what they do in the summer is instrumental in getting to uh, an amazing university like this one. Um, we actually have many high, school, high schools now accepting those things for credit, which is great. Um, people report, people who have a college degree self-report that 75% believe the time is better spent in terms of what they learn for time uh, in an online classroom, uh, in our classes, than it is uh, in college. And that number should not be mistaken as college is wrong. College offers many more things that we don't offer. This is just one slice of learning. It's important to understand this. This is not a replacement, it's an enhancement. But in this targeted, focused, learn-by-quizzing uh, environment, Online is actually quite amazing. You can rewind your professor, you can go at your own speed. You have a lot of things you can't do in a classroom. And finally, uh, in the very first class, I was fortunate enough to teach the same class at Stanford uh, and online, and these have the same exams. 
Um, and there were a number of interesting data points. For one, all my Stanford students went to the online repository and did these quizzes. And of my 200 Stanford students, within weeks, only 30 would show up to class. So I asked them, like the other ones, they all came for the midterm, of course. I asked them, like, why are you guys not coming? And they said, well, honestly, you're better on video. <laughs> and it was kind of devastating, but it's also eye-opening because I always thought of myself as a good professor. I'm entertaining, I look great, I'm cute. <laughs> When I dived in, there was a number of dimensions. One is the ability to get these quizzes done. One is access. They could do it in the morning, in the evening, at their own time. One is having your own speed. If you don't get it, you can go back. You can't do this in the physical class. If you keep raising your hand and say, Professor, again, do this 20, 30 times, your, your the other students will kick you out of the class. You are socialized to not make known that you didn't understand. Right? Unless you have like a one-on-one -on -one tutoring situation, which you of course do it. The other thing that was shocking for me is that all the students in my physical class all of a sudden scored an entire letter grade better than in previous midterm exams and final exams. I always had this moment, and if you're a teacher, you might know this, if you're a lecture-based teacher like me, I would say a poor teacher like me, um, that I always felt the students got it because they all nodded so nicely. And there were like two or three students that I interacted with really intensely. And, and when the midterm came, I was always disappointed. Even the basic stuff was sometimes surprisingly bad. That wasn't the case anymore. All of a sudden, they did never the what rose. And despite that fact, the best students were still the online students. So the top 410 or so students were all online students. And then the 412th best student was the best Stanford student. So let me give you some of the passion behind it. And this is just the beginning of a path. I don't have all the answers. And it's an inquiry, very much like a scientific inquiry, to understand how the human brain works and how can we make systems at scale that allow us to educate. And scale is of importance. If it's not scaling, if you still believe in small classrooms as the only solution for learning, you will never solve the learning situation because that's a dead end in my opinion. So number one, uh, in democratization is cost. Our cost per student, added student, is about a dollar. And now our classes are on all the time. The cost has shrunk down to basically zero, zero cents. Which means now we can basically make education, this style of education, a free good. We can make it a basic human right. Okay? I think that would be phenomenal because a lot of people aren't able to access it for sheer cost reasons. Okay? We can open the classrooms. We can have classrooms with hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. My inspiration. When I think about learning, actual learning, the way most people really learn, I arrive at very different metaphors than classes and lectures and what you're experiencing right now. I arrive at this one. This is my favorite example. I'm sure most of you know what I'm talking about here. Angry Birds is just one of the most amazing learning experiences. It teaches you about physics. You know how birds behave when you put them into a slingshot. <laughs> and if you look carefully, you'll find that you go through a progression of increasingly complex physical scenarios that you really understand when you reach the next level. The only flaw of Angry Birds is you can't get a PhD in physics. So it led you all the way through all the math that's necessary to solve problems and kept you as engaged as you are playing this video game. And made you not just play it, but program it, and so on, then it would be the world's most amazing learning experience. You wouldn't even have to sign up people. They would just do it by themselves, because many of us just play it because we want to get rid of time. We feel, we feel, we feel empowered by the, by the constant feedback we can do something. Now, if Angry Birds was taught by a professor, right, the first lecture would be how the class is organized. Here's my TAs, and here's the time, and here's the criteria. Okay. Second class would be that we go through the history of Angry Birds, really important to appreciate that Angry Birdology is an important scientific discipline. Okay. The next class would be on the equations of Angry Birds. You have to really understand what the basic physics equations are and have to define everything properly uh, to make sure that the, all these subtleties of definitions are not completely lost on you. And eventually I might actually put up a slide showing you how I play Angry Birds. Right. Here's another one that really I, I deeply believe in, and I think it's going to happen, and it has to happen, and it's going to be a big message for all of us. 
for us educators and for us students. The way we arrange life today, somewhat simplified, looks as follows. We have a, a, a phase where we play, and I'm simplifying. We have a primary, secondary education, K through 12. We release our kids to college, and most of you are in that phase right now. And then we disruptively stop college, and we go to work, and then we retire. That layout made a lot of sense when the world was static. My grand-grand-grandparents had one job in their life. In between the time the job started and the time the job ended, not much had happened. But that's not the case today. In my field of computer science, everything changes every 10 years. If your degree is older than 10 years and you haven't kept up to date, you have no clue about what's hot today. Mobile, uh, data centers, um, machine learning, modern machine learning, um, programming languages like Ruby on Rails and Python. I, I should um, point out that none of these things are even taught at most colleges today. People teach things like Lisp and, and ML and stuff that no one ever uses. But stepping a step aside, I think the, the way life should be organized is more like this. And we can debate the exact shape of these lines, but what I'm going to get at is that, that education is a lifelong endeavor and a lifelong need. As society changes, as we try to further ourselves, as we learn new things and have new desires and new aspirations, there should be learning. It blows my mind. My cable company is willing to serve me cable for life. My HMO is willing to give me medical service for, for, for all my life. And I've got a university. They're telling me I keep you for six years or five years and they flush you out and there's no services there after. In fact, the only service there is they're going to call you up for money. Yeah. The classical university handshake. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> Good. Great, you're successful in life. Welcome to Heavy Bank. Why, is, why don't all the universities in the world make lifelong deals and say, we are with you for the rest of your life? As your educational needs change, we are there for you. We update our stuff. And why don't people start working earlier? In my opinion, this thing over here should start right there. People should start working right after high school, maybe even during high school. And if people worked as part of the educational experiences, educational work was was commingled, they would seek better classes. They would know better what they want. Most of us take this gamble and say, I want to be a literature major. Do we know? Do we know how good at it? How do we know? If you worked a little bit on the side, we managed to figure out what, what we like and then change our education on path that suit us much more. It's a big, big mismatch. So that's what I want to get into. And I think we now have a technology that can actually make a good amount of this happen. It's not going to be the same as the college experience, obviously. But for a dollar a student, a close, I can give you an education and aspirations as I've given with AI class to these individual users that you just saw. Then, that's the biggest thing I'm doing right now at Udacity. I want to move education from what I consider, and I apologize for the provocation in advance, a medieval discipline of myths and rumors that are passed from one mouth to another ear into a data-driven science. Just imagine, you just made your class and you go to get asked, you put it online, there's always 100 students in the network, 1,000 students or 10,000 students depending on class size. And you, you, you had this big nagging question in your mind, should we do it this way or that way? Is this quiz better or that quiz better? Should it be a female voice or a male voice? Should it be a long video or a short video? And you toss both of them in an A-B test. And half your students get this and half the students get the other one. Within a day, you would know. And then you can iterate and improve and, get, and, 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 and take a, a, a better, uh, improve your learning material. The current feedback time for learning, and I've been a teacher all my life, are miserable. First of all, you get student evaluations, and I do pay attention to those, um, and they help me improve, but that's the iteration size of one class. But on the real fundamentals, I get almost no information. There's people called education PhDs, and they write theses on these, and it takes like six, seven years for one experiment to run to make a thesis, and it gets published somewhere, and I never get to see the publication because I don't go to education conferences. We kind of separate the, 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 the uh, field of, of pedagogy and education entirely from the field of engineering. 
and there's just no crosstalk. And the only way I've learned is, well, I graduated and I got a job and I had to teach, so that's how I became a teacher. Never received a single piece of advice how to teach as a teacher. So I would love to see a Udacity type system merge into one where you can do real-time experiments, very much like Rich Sutton does in reinforcement learning, and run the experiment and get the data and then use the data to improve your education. If you achieve this, I predict the rate of progress in quality of education will surpass the rate of progress in the last 1,000 years by a factor of any number you pick. Because now we can turn teaching into a data-driven science. Finally, I want to close with an anecdote. This is David Evans. David Evans uh, is a professor at Virginia who is on leave and is our VP for education. Next to him is a nine-year-old girl who aced our fairly advanced and challenging um, CS 101 class. A subtitle, Build Your Own Google. In, in one class, you go from no programming skills to basically implementing an entire search engine, including page rank and everything. So it's a, it's a demanding class, to be honest. Understated. Um, it's also a girl, which is great. It's less discrimination against girls in online classrooms than in physical classrooms. But David is the kind of guy who has now taught almost 200,000 students. He's a celebrity. You can go to a random place on the planet and people greet him and say, hi, professor. We have rock star professors now. <laughs> Being a teacher could actually be a reputable thing. I'm saying this because almost our tenure committees look only after the research part, not after the teaching part. And from my own experience, teaching is always the second most important thing to do if you're a researcher and want to get tenure. What if we could actually have rock star teachers? People are known for their teaching. How cool would that be? I want to close with this and open the field for discussion. Thank you very much for your attention. Let me just uh, give an anecdote about the rock star uh, teacher. I was at the annual AAI conference this summer, and I had a chance to meet with uh, Andrew Ng, who is uh, one of the principals in Coursera, uh, a company that uh, does some of the similar things that Udacity does. And also, I, I talked to Sebastian. But in order to talk to them, I was like 30th in line, because all the people in front of me were people who had taken Andrew's or, or um, Sebastian's course and now they had a chance to meet this person in real life that they had spent many intimate hours together with over the, the past few months. And they were all just incredibly grateful for the learning experience. And they just wanted to say hello and shake hands and, and thank them for a wonderful experience. So uh, one day we could all be rock stars. What a cool idea. I like the idea. Me and Bono. No, never mind. We have time for a few questions. I know that we started a bit late, um, but we probably have a good 10 minutes. So uh, please, if you, if you have some questions, make them short so that we can try and get as many questions in as we can. Uh, I was one of the students in your AI class, uh, and that's one of the reasons. I remember, yes. <laughs> That's one of the reasons I'm uh, back for graduate studies in AI, so really thank you for that. Uh, and also I had one question. Uh, you talked about the paradigm, there are basically two paradigms of courses. One is the traditional way like the AI class was organized in which we have weekly assignments and they are fixed deadline. And the other is like how Salman Khan talked about in which learning is at the rate, you can do it whenever you want. Uh, the thing which I remember when I did my course was that the deadlines made me focus because I knew I had to get home and submit this on time. As humans, we have a natural uh, habit to procrastinate and leave things off until the last moment. So if you organize a course like that, do you have any ideas how you can incentivize people to actually go and complete it? Yes, yeah, so the question pertains to the use of deadlines. Um, and I'm, I'm a little bit torn. Uh, we just had a big analysis internally, data-driven analysis, to see what happened. It turned out without deadlines is correct that the completion rate, they should go down, not up. Um, which, which is sad. I've met a huge number of people who said, I was in the middle of the class, everything was fine, something happened. I was going on a trip, exams came up in my high school, and I fell behind. And then I 
had no way to complete this class. I think fundamentally, principally, it's wrong to put everything on a fixed time end, especially if you want to reach people who do something else at the same time. That's just fundamentally wrong. Uh, but we haven't quite figured out how to get the same kind of motivation that deadline gives to people back into Udacity. So we're currently working on uh, the various A-B tests to see if specific changes of course structure can really affect the student's outcome. Um, and so I agree. It's an open issue. Okay, we have a question. We have a question here at the back. Hi, thank you for the very entertaining talk. I imagine that you're probably familiar with the work of Clay Shirky, who, who talks about his famous phrase is the internet runs on love. So I, I, I think that what you're doing is, is beautiful and amazing. And, but I wonder, what is the business model? Why is it a for-profit model? Because it seems like if you want to give free, excellent education, you want to design these videos, you want them to be available to everyone around the world, there's all these assistants who translate them for free, I think that's fantastic, and I actually think that's something that the internet can do and it already is doing. I just don't understand the, the money part. So if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be terrific. Thank you. I mean, first of all, uh, there's a question why for profit and business model. First of all, for profits are not mandated to make profit. Um, there's, a, there's a good number of for profits in the world that give away their products for free. Um, Google, Facebook, uh, YouTube. In fact, in YouTube's uh, case, they actually help people who make content to make a profit and they live from the profit share. So if you're a good videography and make an entertaining movie that gets watched a million times, you might actually make quite a bit of money on YouTube, and YouTube gets a slice of that. Um, so I want to distinguish the idea of charging from the idea of, of, of being a for-profit. I'm a very deep believer in for-profit companies for a number of reasons. One is if people work day and night and work really hard and they change the world, I think it's fine if they're profit. There's nothing bad about this in my opinion. And then a lot of universities are currently failing in the United States are non-profits. Non-profits are owned by the government, so to speak. Um, but there's no oversight. There's no one who kicks out the CEO of a non-profit who thinks aren't working. There's no one who has an interest in actually making them happen. And many of the non-profit colleges are getting sold for for-profit companies right now and converted and then subsequently fixed or sold or, or, or divided into assets. Uh, fail in part because there's no good oversight. So I think it's I think we should we should align people's incentives and also people's oversight with what you're trying to achieve. Much more important to me is the accessibility, right? It's making this available for everybody in the world. Um, we have a revenue streams right now. We actually made quite a bit of money last month just from companies that are supporting us. Uh, turns out companies care greatly about what we're doing. So we, 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 last month they were actually slightly profitable. Um, we will be doing more on this if we want to extend our ability to, to bring in money. Uh, but, I mean, the nice thing here is we're taking something at Stanford that would cost, I don't know, $1,000, $2,000 a student and bringing it down to a dollar a student. So that we, don't have to, we don't have high operational expenses to really make break even. Press. Can you compare how Udacity compares to uh, Coursera and other companies like that? Yes, so there's a whole bunch of companies out there. Coursera is one, edX is another one. And then if you make it a little bit broader, there's Desire to Learn, there's uh, Tudor, there's um, Newton, and so on. Um, I mean, I have an enormous respect for these companies. And my general take is that everybody is experimenting. Uh, and that's a good thing. So none of us should go up and say we've, have, we've, we've gotten the truth. Okay? Um, our aspire to experiment is really uh, towards the pedagogy more than anything else. If I, if I, even if we go up in flames as a company, I want to be at the position where I can help others and ourselves to really understand how the medium works. That's what I'm striving for. And when you look at the different classes, everybody makes mistakes. We have a lot of mistakes in our class system. You can see this expressed in different ways. So some people work with more with existing universities, very extremely so, maybe Tudor, which actually really is a company that brings Blackboard, another one that there's online programs. About 20% of US enrollments are online today. So there's, there's an entire industry around online. Um, if, I, if I compare that online experience, which is very much like a classroom experience, um, to what we are doing, I hope, uh, my, my gamble is that these more interactive, newly developed methods are better. And I take my motivation from other industries. Early movies were captures, or early full size movies of stage play. The very early movies are full feature movies are stage play movies. And we've seen uh, over the years that movies have evolved to cinematography in something totally different. Very different kind of experience. 
So, so as you change the medium, the experience has to adapt. You can't just replicate the experience. If you look at early television, it was radio reporters sitting in front of a camera. There was television. And it was completely dismissing the idea that the visuals could actually have an importance compared to the, the narrative. And of course, television has evolved, for better or worse, into something it is today. Um, I deeply believe that um, learning and teaching will evolve and it has to adapt to the, to the medium and not the other way around. So anybody, in my opinion, who tries to capture the classroom will probably end up with a product that's actually worse than the classroom itself. That's my prediction. I might be entirely wrong, and it's good to experiment, but I mean, one of the things that we've been pushing is the quizzes, and I see the quizzes now popping up everywhere, in YouTube, and Salman Khan, uh, and so on. And it's great to see this, and then we, we have found out the first ones. Carnegie Mellon did this long before us, and many other entities. But I think experimenting and playing with this is really, really important right now. Thank you. Um, I, I've been playing around with your newly released, or recently released, course builder. And I was wondering if you're going to be turning it into like an LMS that would give uh, Moodle or, or Blackboard a run for its money. Yes, yeah, so LMS stands short for um, Learning Management System, and many of them are very elaborate. There's an entire industry between Chikai and Moodle and, and Blackboard. Um, we have a mi miniature version of this, obviously, here. Like you can sign up and you can keep track of your grades and so on. And my take is I want to leave it at this. Um, I don't want to make a, a full-blown industrial LMS solution because you can only do one thing, or two things in the company. And I'd much rather spend my time on pedagogy and on, on data-driven teaching than I spend on replicating what other companies have done. But who knows what the future brings. If this is actually a successful company, eventually we have to bite the bullet and just get into this business as well, so. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. I have no shortage of opinions. Um, that's my speciality. <laughs> Dr. Om. Um, so we're just starting an experiment right now at this moment on the exact same thing. And the, the experiment was prompted by Steve Blank. Steve Blank in the United States has been recognized by the National Science Foundation as the topmost entrepreneur teachers. He's made a curriculum that's being used at more than 70 schools right now, including Princeton and Berkeley and Stanford and others. Uh, we highly ranked schools. And it's basically the, um, it's called the Lean Lawn Pad. It's a, it's a manual and a, and a recipe for how to start a company. Okay. Steve believes in the hybrid model. And he used Udacity to, 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 to run this together with a company called Startup Weekend. And the model is as follows. Um, In-person in interaction is essential for learning the startup process. And in his class it involves you form a team, you form a, what he calls a business canvas, which is a business plan. Uh, you, you call up customers, you work out numbers, you get to better, and then the teacher beats you up and tells you how wrong you are, and it's all part of the experience. Um, now, he looked at his classes and figured out this is part of the class, but there's so much more. There's also the lecturing and all the semantic stuff and so on. So he'd separated the um, lecturing part, which now sits in Udacity, and, and the, the stuff that we, basically is rep repetitive, with the video stuff, and there's been a pilot in the last um, weeks by uh, Startup Weekend, to host 150 people at a time. And the nice thing about this is they all come informed, right? So they don't walk into the classroom and say, hi, my name is Sebastian. Is there anybody else whom I can start a team with? No, they come in and say, here's my team. Here's our results so far. Beat us up. And as a result, you can condense the entire interaction to one weekend or there's a, there's a five-day version of it as well um, and, and get the same levy out of it. And this costs 150 bucks. And that's so much better for so many people. Like, if you want to learn how to start a startup and you have to spend an entire semester somewhere or one weekend, you'd rather pick the weekend. So I think this kind of hybrid classroom model um, has, a, has a really big future, and I think it's going to really come. It's going to come in so many dimensions where you take the repetitive stuff, like that normally in textbooks, and cash it away in something like Udacity and, and, and augment it with the in-person stuff but make this much more condensed. And that's yet another experiment to run. We don't know what the outcome is. We launched the class last Friday or Friday a week ago. Um, Steve Blank has what, something like 50,000 so students now, which is great. Um, and we'll see how it works. And if you want to start a company, Steve Blank's classes in Udacity free of charge. 
Sebastian, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the University of Alberta for taking the time to come here for a day. It's a, been a wonderful presentation, thought-provoking. Please join me in thanking Sebastian.